right, well, this morning we're going to be finishing chapter 17 of Luke's gospel, verses 22 through 37. I've already mentioned to you that, a, that a, um, perhaps a majority of evangelical churches view this passage as um, talking about something that's yet future to us when um, well, the Lord um, comes and raptures His church out of the world and basically turns again to the Jews to bring about the Great Tribulation. Uh, we don't actually believe that that's the sequence of events um, that are going to unfold, and you need to understand that as we look at this because what this is really talking about <clears throat> is the judgment that God brought against His people in 70 A.D. for their rejection of Him. And I think you'll see that it really makes better sense uh, in, in that context. Well, let me go ahead and begin by reading it. So, verse 22, And He said to His disciples, or to the disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here. Do not go away and do not run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. And answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Not quite clear, isn't it? <laughs> well, this is a lot to look at, but um, we're going to try to do it in our usual time frame. So we may be moving a little bit quickly. But um, let's again remember the main point. Um, God takes his word seriously, and we do need to remember the warning. Remember Lot's wife. Well, again, last time we saw Jesus correcting the, the Pharisees. They were asking, uh, when is the kingdom coming? And in their thinking, of course, that was, they were asking, when was Messiah going to overthrow Rome and reestablish the Jewish rule in Palestine? Well, Jesus' answer was, um, the kingdom that you're expecting is actually already here, but it's not here in the way that you expect it. This kingdom isn't, or actually it wasn't in their day, and it isn't today a kingdom that can be seen by physical eyes. You can't point to it and say, here it is or there it is, because it isn't a physical kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. What Jesus said was, the kingdom is in your midst. It was present because the king was present. But the problem is they couldn't see it because they didn't have spiritual eyes to see it. They didn't have the new birth. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, it requires the Spirit of God to show you. It is a spiritual kingdom in the Lord Jesus. Now, by the way, we need to remember that that is the only way that anyone can see the kingdom of heaven. So when we're praying for our children, when we're praying for others who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to remember that this is what they need. They need the ministry that only the Spirit of God can provide. They need His new birth, regeneration, that new heart. They need to move from death to life to see that. We need to pray that God would have mercy on them. Now, if we've been born again, if we're trusting Jesus, we have seen the kingdom of God. 
We have entered the kingdom of heaven, at least, you know, not, not fully, physically as we will one day, but we have entered spiritually. And we have become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We know that we have because now, more than anything, we want to fight that the kingdom might move forward. Not with physical weapons. Remember, Jesus told us this is a physical kingdom. But with spiritual weapons, the weapons of prayer and the weapon of the word, uh, which the Spirit of God uses to save. And of course, what Jesus said is true of those who belong to the kingdom is also true of us. We are like violent men seeking to enter that kingdom by force because of the desire that we have for it. Well, having corrected the Pharisees, Jesus now turns to correct his disciples because they believed the same thing that the Pharisees believed. They also saw Jesus as a political Messiah. You know, even throughout the entire ministry, even after his death and his resurrection before his ascension, their very last question to him was this in Acts 1.6, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to come now and fight for us, defeat the Romans and give us back our land? Well, Jesus' answer indicated not only that it wouldn't be restored in the kingdom in the way that they were thinking, but it wasn't going to be restored in the time frame that they were expecting. Is it now? No, it, it's not now. Jesus says this in verse 7, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It wasn't now, and it's not for you to know when, but here are two things that I do want you to know. First of all, I'm going to use you to advance the kingdom of heaven with my help. Okay, he says in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Jesus wanted them to know that their work for the next 40 years was going to be to evangelize the, the Roman Empire beginning with the Jews and then moving out to the Gentiles. But secondly, he wanted them to know this, and that is the point of our text this morning. When that work was complete, he wanted them to know what he was intending to do to unbelieving Israel, to those who rejected him. He was bringing judgment, a rather severe judgment upon them. Now that's again what Jesus is talking about in our passage this morning. Now Jesus first tells them that he was about to leave. He says in verse 22, and he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. Jesus, are you, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to lead us against the Romans? Jesus says, I'm not going to stay. Okay? I'm, I'm not remaining here to lead a revolt against Rome. I am about to leave the world. He says the days would come, and those days we know were not very far away because Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, when they would long to see, that is, again, their love for Jesus, their desire for Jesus, they would long to see one of the days that they had enjoyed up to this particular point. One of the days that they had spent with him in, in fellowship, in following Jesus, in serving Jesus, in being taught by Jesus, in sensing his love for them and his protection and his provision. They would long to see one of these days that they had enjoyed with him, but they would not see it. And the reason is because, he says in verse 25, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. We know Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem at this point, his last time in Jerusalem where he would basically um, be arrested by the leaders of Israel, condemned by them, handed over to the Romans, scourged by the Romans. When he, was offered, uh, when he would be offered by Pilate to be released, the people would ask for Barabbas instead. The Romans would take him to Golgotha and execute him in one of the most excruciating ways that has ever been invented by man. He would be crucified. Then he would be buried, rise again the third day, and ascend into heaven after 40 days. Jesus tells his disciples that he was leaving. Okay? 
And that's, by the way, why he says in verse 23, when others claim to see him, when they say to you, look here, look there, they shouldn't go out. He says, do not go away and do not run after them because he would not be there. He wasn't going to be on earth anymore. He wasn't coming back in that way, in a way that they could see to deliver the Jews from the Romans. Okay, I hope you see the point there. Jesus says, I'm leaving. You're going to, you know, if he was coming back uh, that quickly, uh, he, he wouldn't have said that, right? So he is leaving and he's going to be gone for a very long time. But instead, again, of coming back in a way that they could see to deliver the Jews from the Romans, he was coming back, he says, in a way they could not see to destroy those who rejected him. Now, Jesus, I believe, goes on to tell them about 70 A.D. 70 A.D. is when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, overrun, besieged for, I think it was five and a half months, where the suffering inside the city was tremendous, where after the five and a half months, the, the wall was finally broken in and the temple was dismantled, every single stone. And I think if you know a little bit about the history of it, you know that the Romans set fire to the temple, the gold melted, ran down into the cracks, and they had to literally dismantle the, the temple, no small feat, in order to get that gold. But this was God's judgment upon the Jews. And this is what he's talking about here. First, he says this judgment would be swift and unexpected. Verse 24, for just like lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Now, I've already told you that this judgment is going to be carried out by the Romans. When the Lord would judge a nation, he didn't just like he did with, um, well, like he did during the flood or like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, do something supernatural, you know, like flooding the world or raining down fire and brimstone out of heaven. But very often when the Lord judged a nation, he would judge it through another nation, right? He would raise them up against a people. One example we find in Isaiah, uh, chapter 19, verse 1, regarding Egypt. And I want you to listen to this because it sounds very similar to what Jesus will later say about his judgment against, um, against his people in chapter 21. But we read in chapter 19, verse 1 of Isaiah, the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. I want you to notice, first of all, that the Lord pictures himself riding on a cloud. Okay, does that sound familiar? Okay. What he's picturing himself is as a mighty warrior going out to battle, riding on his chariot. In, the case, in this case, the Lord's chariot is a cloud. This is the same, uh, the same image that Jesus uses in chapter 1 and also in Matthew 24, to describe his coming out against the Jews. You will see the Son of Man on a cloud with power and great glory. Notice also through whom the Lord says he's going to bring this judgment upon the Egyptians. He's going to use the Egyptians themselves. He's going to turn them against each other. We read in Isaiah 19 verse 2. So I will incite Egyptians against Egyptians and they will each fight against his brother and each against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. You know, on another occasion when the Lord was bringing judgment against his people Israel, uh, he revealed to Habakkuk, the prophet, that he was going to do it through the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk seeks the Lord. He, he as it were, gets on top of this tower and he begins to seek the Lord and he asks, Lord, how can you judge your people with a nation that is more wicked than your people. Well, God says, I'm going to do it. This is my judgment against my people. But once the Chaldeans have, have destroyed my people, then I'm going to judge them for their wickedness in destroying my people. God often uses another nation to bring judgment on other nations or even on his own people. Now, Jesus says here he was going to bring judgment. But the question is, through whom was he going to bring this judgment? It was going to come through the Roman army. And we know that that is actually what happened historically. It's interesting that we read in a parallel passage in Matthew 24, verse 27, where Jesus is talking about the very same thing. He says this, 
For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, which means it will be swift. But it also, some see within this, an indication of the direction of the judgment from the east to the west. Josephus writes in his Wars of the Jews that the Roman army marched to the east of Jerusalem and then moved westward against them. Now Jesus tells us the unexpected nature of this attack would catch the Jews off guard. They would basically be going about their ordinary things and weren't expecting this to take place. We read in verses 26 through 30 of our passage, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. You know, the Romans caught the Jews completely off guard. As a matter of fact, they attacked during the Feast of Passover in 70 AD. And not only were the Jews unprepared in this case, it ended up trapping many more of them in the city than otherwise might have been there, greatly increasing their suffering. You know, you can imagine there was lots of food because they were feasting. But virtually every, every well, every male Jew from the entire Roman Empire had to be there for that feast. And when the Romans surrounded them, they were all trapped inside the city. Now, Jesus is telling his disciples that he wasn't staying to lead a Jewish revolt against the Romans. He was leaving in order to return to lead Rome against the Jews. That's interesting, isn't it? But that is God's judgment. Now, the last question is, why was he telling his disciples this? Well, for the reason he also tells us anything, for our good, because he cares about us, because he wants us to be ready. But notice, why would he tell his disciples this in particular? Well, it's because this was going to happen in their lifetime. And they needed to be ready in order to escape. And not only did they need to be ready, but they needed to get those they ministered to to be ready as well. When this judgment came, when, uh, which Jesus tells us in chapter 21, verse 20 of Luke's gospel, which we'll get to in, in, in our time, that that would be signaled by Jerusalem's being surrounded by the Roman armies. And when they saw that taking place, they needed to get out of the land as quickly as they possibly could. He says in verse 31 of our text, On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the field or in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Now, Jesus draws their attention to Lot's wife. Okay, remember Lot's wife. The angels told Lot and his family that if they were to escape the judgment that God was bringing upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, that they needed to leave and not look back. But Lot's wife did look back, presumably because she couldn't let go of what it was she had in that city and because her heart was still in the city, she was destroyed along with Sodom. Jesus was telling his disciples here that if they hesitated to get something out of the house that they wanted, if they just couldn't let go of those possessions, that they too would lose their lives. Jesus says, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. If you want to hold on to a portion of your life, you're going to end up losing your life. But if you would let it all go and leave it all behind and flee, that you would be spared. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. So again, judgment is coming. Jesus wanted his disciples to be ready. When you see these things taking place, get out of the city as quickly as you can. Don't hesitate for a moment, not even to get one single item. Get out of the land. And you know, historically, the Christians were the ones who were ready for this attack when it came. And when they saw these things taking place, they fled to the mountains and they were actually spared. Now, what about those who didn't escape? Okay, what was going to happen to them? Well, Jesus said it, it wouldn't go well. One half would be spared. 
one half outside the city, but the other half would be taken. And that's what Jesus is referring to in verses 34 through 36. Jesus said, I tell you on that night there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place, one will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other will be left. Now, the ones who are, who are left are basically spared. But what's going to happen to those who are taken? Well, you know, that's what the disciples wanted to know. And so they asked Jesus, and answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Well, that sounds perfectly clear, doesn't it? Now, that sounds a little bit cryptic. And so we need to think about what, what, was, what was Jesus talking about here? I've already told you that most evangelicals today see what Jesus is talking about here as an event that is still future to us. They believe that what Jesus is talking about here is his second coming to rapture the church out of the world. And that Jesus is referring here to the rapture that the, where the body is, and that would be the body of Christ being caught up in the air, uh, that's, well, that's where they're going to be, where the, where the vulture is. I guess Jesus would be the vulture in this case, and <laughs> they, they would be the body. But in this case, they're taken up to heaven, right, where they're kept safe from the tribulation. Now, here's a quick overview of, of eschatology that we have to be aware of, of, of last things in order to understand that it can't mean that. The problem with that view is that Paul tells us that that the resurrection is going to take place at the same time that um, the rapture takes place. That's, you know, the rapture we think of as people who are still alive being caught up. And by the way, that is going to happen. But it's going to happen uh, at one time universally for everybody who is alive. And it has a specific purpose to gather everybody together for the final judgment. But do you understand that the same thing is true of the resurrection? When... Um, uh, well, when, when the rapture takes place, the resurrection of, the, of Christians is going to take place. But when that takes place, the resurrection of all men is going to take place. Okay, well, first of all, let's understand that the resurrection of the righteous is going to take place at the same time the rapture of believers takes place. That much is clear in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first before believers are caught up, the, you know, the living ones. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Okay? When the rapture takes place, the resurrection of the righteous is going to take place. Okay, I don't think there's any question about that. But when the resurrection takes place, it's not going to be just believers that are raised. Jesus says everyone is going to be raised at the same time, as well as all the living raptured in order to meet in one place. And that is to be gathered together for the final judgment. Now, how do we know that? Because of what Jesus says in John 5, verses 28 through 29. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. What does he mean by all? Not just all believers, but also all unbelievers. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. You see, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs come forth and they come forth for judgment. So the question here is, if that's true, then when the rapture takes place and the resurrection takes place, there can't be anybody left, right? But Jesus tells us in this particular event, there are people who are left. One is taken and the other is left. So what does he mean by this? What does he mean? Well, we believe those who are left are spared. <clears throat> but what about those who are taken? What does he mean by where the body is there also the vultures will be gathered? Well, what do you usually think of when you think of a body and vultures, okay? You think of a vultures eating dead bodies, and that's exactly what's happening here. These who are taken are killed, and they become food for the vultures. That's, that's one way of looking at it. The other view is the word vulture can also refer to eagle. I mean, it's the same word in, in the Greek. 
And it could be that Jesus was saying they're going to be taken by the eagles and they're going to be killed. That is, by the Romans, whose standard was the eagle. Okay, so he's talking here about a Roman attack and he's talking about a great amount of death. And let's not forget, there were also many people trapped in the city who underwent the greatest suffering during a siege that lasted for many, many months and they had to endure things that, that Jesus said no people on earth ever had to endure. Even the Holocaust was nothing compared to this. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 21, For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. He's talking here about 70 AD and what happened to the Jewish people within the, the, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the suffering became horrible, there was starvation, there was cannibalism, uh, there was uh, civil war, there was all kinds of things going on in the city that just made things miserable. So again, the bottom line is this, Jesus is correcting his disciples and he's telling them, I'm not staying to lead a revolt against Rome. I'm actually leaving, first of all, to save you. But then I am returning through the armies of Rome to bring judgment on the Jews. And I'm telling you this in advance so that you will be ready when it happens because it's going to happen in your lifetime. When it happens, get out quickly. Now, in closing, we need again to remember that Jesus has warned us also of judgment. Okay? There is another judgment that is ahead of us. It's called the final judgment, the one that we've already looked at, that, that I've already made reference to, because when Jesus comes and he raptures, you know, his church, and when he raises the, uh, you know, the believers who are dead in Christ, at that same time, all the tombs are going to empty out, and the entire world is going to be gathered together for that judgment. When that day comes, it's going to come quickly. He's going to return quickly to raise the, the, the dead and gather the living. Uh, when that happens it's going to be too late to do anything about it, okay? There, there isn't going to be anything that we're necessarily called to do when we see this taking place because there's nothing left to do. You're either ready or you're not ready. By the way, which is going to come first, okay? The, the day of our, cry, of, of our Lord's second return, His second coming, or the day of our death? You know, we need to be ready, don't we? Before Jesus comes, uh, it, some believe he, he could come at you know, any time. Others believe his coming is still a little ways off. Uh, I happen to be in that latter group. I think I'm going to die before Jesus comes. We need to be ready because we don't know when he's going to come for us as individuals to say that's it for our lives, right? And you're either ready or you're not ready. And then on that day of judgment, we will have to stand before him to give an account of our lives, okay? So we need to be ready. So how can we be ready? We need to heed Jesus' warning. Remember Lot's wife. We need to do something she didn't do, okay? We need to keep looking ahead. We need to let go of this world, don't we? Jesus said we need to lose our lives here in order that we may gain them there. The only way we can do this is by looking to Jesus you know, we need him. We need his perfect obedience. We need his atoning death. We need to trust him alone to make us right. But we need to do more than just that act, which is something we should be doing every day, trusting in Jesus. We need to be following Jesus at all times. We need to be living according to his word. Having left the world, having escaped the defilements of the world by God's grace, we need to make sure that we don't turn back that's what Lot's wife did. She turned back and she was destroyed. If we turn back to the world, having come to Jesus Christ, what does that mean? Well, it means we never come to Jesus, have we? You know, it means we're unbelievers because no true believer is ever lost. But it also means not being believers, we will be destroyed along with the world. Remember what Peter told us already in our meditation for if after, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. 
this is talking about apostasy, isn't it? You know, you, you believe that you're a Christian and you continue for a while, but then you turn away. And, and, you know, you don't have to actually leave the church to turn away. That can happen in your heart and in your mind. And you can continue to, to leave, live at least externally as a believer, but still have your heart in the world. No, we have to be basically separated from the world and not love the world or the things in the world. Remember what John tells us. Those who love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Okay? We need to love Him most of all. So if we turn back, if, if we do what Lot's wife did, we will perish along with the world. But if we persevere, like Lot we might use as an example, right, who just kept going, he didn't look back. If we persevere by his grace, we will be saved. Let's not forget what the author to the Hebrews wrote to his, to his congregation that was being tempted to go back to the, the Old Testament ceremonial law in order to escape the persecution of the Romans. Uh, he, he warns that those who do are, are crucifying Christ anew, as it were, saying that he deserved to die. Uh, and they are basically fallen under God's wrath. But he, he says this then to his congregation. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. You see, that's what Jesus is calling his disciples. That's what he's telling them that they need. That is what Jesus is telling us that we need. We need to have a faith that preserves our souls. We need to keep looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes upon him and moving forward, running the race, setting aside everything that gets in our way in order that we might make it to the finish line. If we are trusting in the Lord Jesus, the good news is that we will make it. We will make it all the way to the end. So keep your eyes on him. Listen to his warnings. Don't turn back. Keep your eyes fastened on Jesus, and he will make sure that you do. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to help us.